We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, we talk about national politics, world politics a lot on the podcast. Uh, today, we're bringing it back to the state, greatest state in in the uh, nation, greatest nation in the country, really. It's maybe what I would call Texas. Um, with uh, Dr. Tom Oliverson, uh, representative uh, at the state legislature from uh, uh, near me in my area. Oh, what, what's the what's the number, Tom? So I'm House District 130, which is Tom Ball and Cypress. So we we overlapped um, in my previous district. I'm not I'm not. I'd have to look at a map to see if we we still overlap. I don't think so. Um, but uh, we overlapped. Gotten to know you. It's uh it's great to serve alongside you in this for this great state. And you guys have had a really busy session. So so this podcast will be about what you did this session. You know your 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 focus is as a doctor has been on healthcare. Mm-hmm. Um, you know I, you led the charge on 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 what I'm passionate about too at the federal level, which is which is uh stopping trans trans what do you what's even the right term i don't even like gender affirming care for minors at children's hospitals yeah. and hospitals in general i mean it's banned in texas period it's against the law I, I call uh, it gender mutilation because because it's you know if you think about mutilation it's not possible to get backward from where you started and that's no what this is. it's not and that's a key point i don't know, like well let's go down the rabbit hole i mean this is a free-flowing conversation let's just go down the rabbit hole since we talked about it yeah. and now the audience is like well you can't stop talking about it <laughs> That, that's the thing. And that's a key point I made um, at, at that hearing recently. So, you know, to remind the audience, uh, th- this, th- this kind of, this kind of uh, treatment is is now banned in Texas period uh, for right. what is it under, under 18, right? Under 18. Right. So puberty blockers, hormone therapy, tra- sur- surgical uh, interventions, all banned. That's right. Um, all three. And at the federal level, what we're doing is, uh, you know, we're attaching federal funding to to it. So children's hospitals get uh, all sorts of different federal funding. But for this particular federal funding, it's it's renewed every five years. So it's kind of a must pass bill. Uh, hmm. you, you need to pass the bill. It's 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 money that these children's hospitals are relying on to to fund their residence programs. And we're saying, look, you're not going to get federal taxpayer money, which comes from 100 percent of taxpayers by definition. When Mm -hmm. 70, 80, I think actually more like 90% are opposed to the kind of things you're doing. And it's, it's just like the Hyde amendment, right? Like if it's a divisive issue, let's at least agree on the fact that everybody's tax money shouldn't be used to, to, to engage in it, to actively pursue it, right? Let it be up for political debate. Like it is in Texas. And so that drove a lot of people crazy. <laughs> oh my God, made it made some headlines. We had a lot of fun with that. But one of the points I made was exactly that. It's irreversible. And that's the sure. thing. If you're gonna if you're gonna have an irreversible operation and all three of those things, puberty blockers, hormone therapy, surgical interventions, obviously, they're all irreversible. And so you better know that the benefits are just wildly like beyond belief. We're 100 percent sure this is like the most beneficial thing ever, turning girls into boys and boys into girls. It's so beneficial. Of course it's not beneficial. <laughs> Right. And the evidence no. demonstrates that. Right. And so what right. was that debate like at the state level? I mean, how I'm curious. I I think, you know, it went surprisingly well. Um, I didn't, you know, at least to, that I'm aware of, I didn't receive any death threats. Um, and I would say that to your point, the number of people that showed up uh, when we were working on this bill that were in support of the bill that we were working on that filled the gallery in the Texas House, which, you know, probably seats. Uh, oh, you know, maybe a thousand, maybe 2000 people. I don't know exactly what the number is, but it was like five to sometimes 10 to one in favor of what we were working on. Um, but, you know, I, I think, Dan, the, the, the key things is that there are these uh, as as the left often does, there are sort of these uh, these straw men that they sort of put up uh, arguments that really sort of detract from. The reality of the situation. I mean, you know, if you boil this issue down to sort of its 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 core base, what you're talking about is doing irreversible medical and surgical treatments for a mental health condition. We don't do that. We haven't done that in America for probably 
close to, I think the last frontal lobotomy in America was performed in the 1950s. I mentioned um, that too. It's like, this is, this is no different than the craziness surrounding electroshock therapy and frontal lobotomies. What's the difference? Right. And I remember saying that people were like, you know, ah, uh, gender affirming care, or all this kind of stuff. And I was like, look, we're talking about treating a mental health condition. Is gender dysphoria real? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I was like, very clear. I'm not saying that people aren't born or, you know, aren't growing up having difficulty accepting how they look, mm -hmm. um, how they, you know, relate to their peers or their environment. And maybe part of that is a conclusion that maybe they were not born the right person. You know, those are all questions that people can ask in puberty, as it turns out, as, as I think everybody remembers, is a time where a lot is upside down and a lot is uncertain and, and you question a lot and you're trying to fit in and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But what we don't do, um, I compared it to anorexia. I don't know how familiar your listeners are with anorexia, but, you know, um, the thing that anorexia and bulimia have in common with gender dysphoria is that they're all disorders, what we call body dysmorphia, which means that mm -hmm. the way I see myself yeah. causes distress and is distorted compared to the reality of, of how I actually am. You know, I look at myself in the mirror and I think I'm fat, even though I'm malnourished and very skinny. Um, I don't see myself normally. It's the same kind of thing. You don't, a good point. First of all, you don't, you don't say to somebody with anorexia, you know what? you need to be who you are. Go ahead and starve yourself to death. You yeah. provide mental health treatment so that they can come to terms with who they really are. Uh, and so why aren't we doing the same thing with this? Why are we in such a rush to take kids who can't even legally sign a document authorizing treatment and putting them down this pathway of irreversible treatments? I think that's, that's the number one question that we have to ask on this issue is how does this make sense in a state or a country where you can't smoke, can't drink, can't sign a legal document, can't even get a tattoo until yeah. you're 18, but we're going to permanently alter your biology because you can't get a right tattoo. Now Is that true? Not even with parental permission. Yeah. Yeah. I Is learned that, that as I was working on Yeah. Uh, oh, really? It's like a crazy place. I'm assuming that's just in Texas, right? I mean, I, I, but probably most be. states, probably most states have the yeah. same law, just like smoking and drinking. I mean, we don't have to make driving, the drinking age 21. Loading. We could change it. We just don't, right? <laughs> like, it's just, we just don't. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't get a tattoo. I mean, what about like, so how, how does this law function? I don't want to get too many weeds in it, but how does it function yeah. in practice? I mean, so, so, I'm, so I'm, I'm assuming that all like cosmetic surgeries, then whether they're for gender affirming care or not, are just, you can't do that under 18 or you can't, or is there exceptions? How does that work? So, so there are exceptions. Uh, the way it works is that, first of all, it, it, it's looking at an unhealthy, uh, unsafe, um, not supported by the literature and state views as dangerous practice of medicine. Mm -hmm. And it's regulating the practice of medicine. Uh, I, I know there'll be lawsuits about this. I'm sure I'm, I'm really looking forward to somebody trying to get up there and articulate before a judge that a state doesn't have the right to regulate the practice of medicine, considering yeah. what we've just gone through with COVID and mm -hmm. the opioid crisis before that, and you know all these kind of things, but basically what it says is that if for uh, a child uh, with the diagnosis of gender dysphoria or experiencing gender dysphoria, you cannot provide cross-sex hormones, puberty blockers, or do surgery on them, and it it actually lays out a pretty exhaustive yeah. list of all the surgeries. Got it. it provides yeah, you were, exceptions. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say it provides exceptions for a couple of, of areas. One, it makes it clear that using puberty blockers for the treatment of precocious puberty, which is an abnormal condition of human development, mm -hmm. uh, as well as other abnormal conditions like chromosomal abnormalities and testicular feminization and, and these various conditions yeah. that exist real like real body. physical conditions very yeah. rare but they are possible right so those are carved out and then we also have a, a limited right of sort of wean off of uh, so for kids who have been on these medications as you know testosterone and, and estrogen are mood altering substances and uh and so you know uh, if you're treating so you, somebody, it, you, you can't just cut them off if they're already on it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So, That's smart. So we have a wean off provision as well for that. So, 
how, how worried are you? And I can't imagine the answer is that we'd be really worried about this just because it's such a risk, but you know, that doctors might just diagnose someone differently in order to give them the treatment that they want to give them, but just because they're that radicalized, I mean, obviously you'd lose your license if you got caught. I can't imagine. It just doesn't seem like we were too worried about that, but what do you, what, what do you think? I think they'd have to come up with an exception under that, under that law in order for that to work. It, have to be one of these genetically verifiable chromosomal mm-hmm. disorders. A disorder. So what about, of, what, what about a, a just a, a cosmetic, uh, uh, a cosmetic surgical intervention? I don't even know what the law is for for under eighteen. What what is it current? You can't even get that anyway. I think you can actually. You can and okay, I but that, and that's still that would still be legal. Yeah, like, we so, didn't so, we didn't touch that, and yeah. we also didn't touch mental health stuff. You know, I think. There are those that would say, well, you know, we should really look at the whole issue of gender affirming care. Um, And there's good evidence for that. Honestly, if you look at the CAST report from England, it talks about social transitioning in schools and other Mm -hmm. public places. And it says, you know, regardless of whether or not you think this is a good idea or a bad idea, it's not a neutral act. If you socially transition a, a child just like you teach them to put their name and the period and the teacher's name in the upper right-hand corner of their paper, you can condition somebody to think of themselves in a certain way. Right. Which is definitely what happened. I mean, you wouldn't, yeah, I know what study you're talking about. I mean, I can't remember what the numbers were. It's like six times more likely if you have uh, that you'll identify as transgender, if you have friends who identify that way, this is, this is, you don't need a study to to know this. This is, this is intuitive. This is a self-evident fact about, about Mm -hmm. human development if it's around you, you will copy it. You will, you will, you will, you will mimic it. Talk to me more about that's the politics of it. Like, uh, you got, I would say that's why teenagers like TikTok, right? Because they see their yeah. friends doing it. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a reason we have a word for. We have a word for it. It's called a trend. You know, like mm-hmm. if you see people dressing a certain way, you yeah. dress that way. You don't just randomly dress different. Like, of course, like come on, this is this is what's going on. So. Talk to me more about the politics. I'm, I'm still interested at the state level because like I look at, I know yeah. I'm having this debate in, 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 in Congress and I'm looking across and I'm like, there's no way any of you guys on the Democrat side believed this stuff five minutes ago. There's just no way. Right. Like, and you didn't. Let's be honest. You did. You never thought this was a good idea. You just feel bullied into it by your activists. There's no way you believe it. What, what is your what is your sense of that at the state level? Because I, I feel like our at the state level, at least in Texas, there's a lot more camaraderie uh, between everybody for the most part. A little, I think a little bit more truth telling. I don't know. I mean, well, you tell well, me. Well, there wasn't bipartisanship. I mean, there were Democrats that crossed the aisle and voted for this. I mean, so, uh, I think it was like three or four um, out of a caucus of, of uh, I forget exactly how many they have. I think it's like 50 something Um not nothing, not a well, lot. Not yeah. nothing. But what was interesting to me is that uh, some of these folks, I met with them very early in the session uh, because they knew I was working on this and they would just come to me periodically and bring me a study or they'd say, have you heard this? Have you read this? What do you think about this? So, you know, they're thinking about it. Um, I have to say, and I I know you share this value that it frustrates me that sometimes we elect people to public office that are up there just to sort of be talking heads, you know, to inspire outrage, to, you know, get on the camera and say a bunch of stuff. And, uh, hang on, my automatic light just turned off there yeah. in my office. I was like, just but, uh, but they don't actually think through the process. They don't, don't actually get to yes. They don't actually come up with a solution. But what I found is that there were some Democrats in, in the house that this was an issue they were very much wrestling with all session. And they were asking the right questions. Like, yeah, what does the research say? Um, so I do think if you're honest about it from an intellectual standpoint, I think it's very hard to parade around with the idea that this is perfectly normal, nothing to see here. Just, you know, yeah. stop picking and how, kids. how hard, how hard did they fight it? Like, were they, was there any, like how many were like truly passionate about, about, about doing surgical interventions and, and giving girls double mastectomies if they think they're a boy? I mean, how many were like really passionate about this and how many were like, well, I'm going to vote no, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. I would say there were probably 15 or 20, uh, I think almost all of whom were members of our LGBTQ caucus allied friends, you know, group. Um, and that was the hill they were going to die on all mm-hmm. session long. Yeah. Uh, they killed it last session. They were looking forward to killing it again. Uh, and so 
there were also, to your point, a lot of people that just sat quietly at their desk and didn't really engage in the conversation. Um, but we fought about it for a good eight hours. I, I had to fight off a dozen hostile amendments. And um, and then, of course, at the end, you know, we finished talking about the bill. And then, as I'm sure that I'm sure you do at the federal level, people can get up and speak in favor or against the bill. And so then I probably had, you know, seven, maybe as many at one point as 10 people that wanted to get up and speak for five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes attacking the bill and saying how horrible of a human being I was and everybody was and all this kind of stuff. I think it's weird to be part of the LGBT, you know, caucus and support this. There's a, there's a lot of people in the gay community that are appalled by this nonsense. I mean, to say that it's just this sort of like one track mind, uh, you know, single mindset type of group, I think is unfair. And, uh, but that's what they do. And they, it's, it's, this is, this is nuts. Um, it's, it's gone too far. I think a lot of the stuff with kids and this, the weird obsession with, with the drag queen story hour and like, you know, it's just why. Mm-hmm. And, and I, mean, I, I think for, part, I think a part of that, I think, I think they see the rights reaction and they're like, we, they, they, there's, 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 I, I do get the sense that because we react so strongly, it encourages them to do it more to trigger the right. I, you know, just kind of like we will do stuff to do to them as well. I've seen all that play out, but it's still just at its core, though, uh, very unsettling. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's hard to understand. Um, it is. Do, do you feel like because I know I do that, that the left in this country, there's sort of a core thought process there that we identify a group that we feel as though maybe hasn't gotten a fair shake and we lift them up to the exclusion of all others. And then when they've been lifted up, we find a new group and we move. And that's how we sort of reconstitute and yeah. sort of refresh the well of our voting bases that we're constantly. I mean, you look at what's going on in women's sports right now. Yeah. You got women who have, you know, successfully been able to compete in an, in an athletic competitions thanks to Title IX, which they fought very hard to get. Uh, and and now you have the same party that essentially fought very hard to get that is basically trampling all over by letting men compete against women in sports. I mean, it's just it's so where's the where's the where's the party of pro woman? You know, yeah. I mean, well, there's, there's nothing to anchor. The problem with the left, I always tell people, is they don't have an anchoring philosophy. Right. They, they, what they have is this emotional, constant search for injustice and they'll find it. They'll find it somewhere. I I love the Thomas Sowell quote. It's like, he's like, racism is not dead, but it is keep being kept on life support by the left. You know, that's that kind of perfect way of putting it. Like, and it's, and it's that, I mean, you know, look at the, look at the reaction to the affirmative action ruling today. So just for the, you know, I don't know when this podcast will air, but because we really only do like one a week. But um, the, today is the day the Supreme Court uh, uh, reversed affirmative action, made it unconstitutional. Same thing, right? It's, it's this constant search for injustice. They'll always find something and it, it'll get weirder and weirder because the truth of the matter is the, the world has gotten better uh, and less and less unjust. And so eventually, like you, you just got to you got to look for to, to really strange places to find these like these, these systemic injustices that they constantly claim. And I think that explains just why it's gotten so strange. And like, because yeah. I'm like, by necessity, there has to be an end point. Like there's there has to be an end point to your so-called progress. Like the, at, a, at a certain point, you've reached some kind of balance. And like, obviously, the world isn't close to being perfect, but. But that's mostly because of human nature, not so much because of the system that we adhere to, you know, you, you mm-hmm. got, and you got to differentiate between the two. Um, I think it's fascinating that to your point, I, I'm i aware of the research does definitely support the idea. You were talking about fracturing within the, the LGBTQ caucus, and I've been seeing a lot of that lately. You know, it's time for LG and B to ditch the rest of this because it's actually true. harming us as a community. The literature actually supports that. If you take, uh, there was some very interesting studies out of Italy that were looking at what happens if you take children children who are expressing gender dysphoria and you just give them supportive therapy and counseling. What 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 is the long term success rate for that? And they found that between sixty and ninety percent of them, it spontaneously resolves by the time they reach the third decade of life. And of those, more than fifty percent of them are same sex attracted. Yeah. So, yeah. of course, when I brought this I've up to my LGBTQ too. caucus members, they just had a mega meltdown because it's kind of like, well, sometimes it's hard to look in the mirror and realize that you're eating your own. You're you literally are. 
doing your own. I I talked with a psychologist, uh, and he and he specializes in caring for adults, young adults who have gone down the gender transition pathway that realize it was a mistake. Um, and he said, if, if you really want to know what the definition of hopelessness and anger is, he said, try talking to a 27 year old born as a male transitioned to female realized in his early twenties that he was just gay. And now men don't find him attractive because they don't find him attractive as a woman. He's not a man. He can have no meaningful relationships, no intimacy of any kind with the people that he desperately wants to be with. I mean, just imagine how awful that would be to be in that position. And it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's a form of hell for sure. Um, you, you think about the the surgical interventions, you know, the castration, and this. I mean, it's this is this is another part of this whole thing. Like, you're a doctor. I mean, this is not a this is not a well developed form of medicine, is it? It is experimental, honestly. Uh, and I think if you look back at at the literature, <clears throat> you know, this whole concept of pediatric gender modification mutilation began because there was a question that was asked, and when in in uh, the Netherlands, when they were looking at outcomes for adults transitioning, they said, well, you know. Um, maybe we could get a higher success rate if we started earlier. And so that's how this whole thing came about is like, if you, if you transition them to the other side before they hit puberty, then maybe they'll be happier. Cause you know, they won't, they won't have facial hair and they won't have deep voices and they won't, you know, or, or whatever uh, you get them before they develop breasts or whatever. Um, and so that was sort of the hypothesis, but Dan, you know, I, I know you're a scientist too. I, they they went. I, I took a class once. I'm not going to say I'm not yeah. exactly. A, I stayed at a Holiday yeah. Inn, so, so I'm basically you, a scientist. You have yeah. a very good command of the science, though. And so what <laughs> they did is, if you remember, the scientific method is you start off with a question, you develop a hypothesis, mm -hmm. you design a study, and then you basically um, analyze the results and you come up with some conclusions. Well, somewhere along the line, you you do what's called. Um, where you're sort of experimenting around, you're doing what's, you know, sort of novel study where you're looking at, let's try something different and see if it works. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. You know, it seems like it works in certain cases. Okay, great. Well, the next step is now we do multi-center randomized controlled trials where we try to eliminate any confounding variables and things like that. And then <clears throat> we say, did it really work or did it just have the appearance of working? because maybe we picked the right small sample of people. And so, because we only looked at a dozen kids, um, yeah. the original Dutch studies, as they went along in this process, because remember, it wasn't meant to be definitive, exhaustive, like end all be all research. They actually carve out their treatment failures as they go along. So of course their success rates look incredibly high because if people are lost to follow up, then they're just not included in the study. Well, what would be what would be the number one reason why a child that's undergoing gender modification suddenly stops showing up for their appointments and doesn't take their medicines anymore? Oh, Make I don't feel know. terrible <laughs> feel that way anymore. But they carved all that out. It's really? not in their results. So is that, so is that one whole, of their favorite? Is that one of their favorite studies to cite? Yeah, the 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 Dutch studies they call them. There's two, uh, and those are sort of the quote, gold standard that WPATH mm -hmm. here in America likes to point to, and it's sort of the jumping off point for a lot of this other research. But you know, a lot of the other research that they do when they're looking at suicide rates and stuff like that, these are questionnaires. These are surveys that kids are fit choosing to fill out. Yeah. And then they're harvesting data out of a broad survey on sexual health or, you know, adolescent viewpoints on the world. And they're pulling this series of questions out and they're making, and they're saying we're carving this in stone tablets now. Well, <clears throat> as you know, um, I can design a poll right now uh, that, that can say that, you know, 99% of Americans think that open borders are great uh, and only 1% thinks that they're not great. Mm -hmm. It depends on how they ask the questions. It depends right. on which people actually like, do I do an internet poll do I do a mail out poll? I mean, you know, do I stand there in front of the bank and do it? Or do I go to the in front of the 7-Eleven? You know, <clears throat> none of that is taken into account when you look at these cross-sectional, 
you know, studies where they're looking at people's responses to questionnaires that they voluntarily filled out. Uh, and, so the, just, it, and the other thing I pointed out in, in the hearing we did on this was, look, it, there's going to be studies. There's tons and there's there's plenty of st studies and, and reviews to go over. And so the proper way to to establish a standard, to establish sort of a, a coherent understanding of, of what the evidence says is to do a systematic review. And mm -hmm. the, those have been done and the evidence and then conclusions are all the same, that there's that there's no benefits. I mean, again, and that's the key question they're asking. Is there really benefits to this therapy? Like we, the negatives are pretty obvious. Um, I'm not, yeah. but, but the, so if you're going to impose a, a permanent change, a permanent physiological change on someone, what's the benefit? I mean, if you have cancer in your kidney, then there's clearly a benefit in removing it, right? Like there's, I mean, yeah, right. Study, there's, study there's, you will, you will do better. Um, yeah. You know, they actually, I didn't lose my right eye when I was blown up. It was just torn to pieces. They took it out in surgery. So they removed a body part from my head. You wouldn't normally do that unless there's a benefit. And the benefit in this case is your other eye heals better uh, when it's not trying to, when your body isn't trying to heal your crappy eye that's been shredded. So, you know, it's not like it popped out of my head when I got blown up, right? It's not like the movies that it rolled around on the ground. Somebody picked it up, ate it. Uh, it's like, know, like pirates of the Caribbean, right? Remember there was yeah. that one guy. Yes, <laughs> it's exactly what everybody thinks too exactly about eyes. Everybody thinks about prosthetics is like, they, they're always expecting it to be a big ball. Uh, you as a doctor though, that's just not sure. It's more like a, a, almost like a plate, like a bowl that gets like shoved in there. Um, it's just, it, it freaks people out. I can just like pop it out at them. Like, what is that? Um, but it was, it was, it kind of gets to the point too, about just, you know, and the point I made was, look, my my daughter's going to grow up with a father with one eye. Will she identify as a one eyed person? Will she want to go to a doctor and say, I want to be just like my daddy? Yeah. And should that doctor remove her eye? And I'll point out too, I'm like, it's not even that great of an analogy because frankly, losing an eye is far less important than than a, a like a gender transformation. <laughs> mm -hmm. like, like it's far less consequential from just a, a, a physiological standpoint. Than than yeah. than a castration or whatever the reverse is called, um, it's just uh, I just can't believe this stuff sometimes. What else? What else in the in the is is gone on this session? So you know, for people listening who aren't from Texas, we 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 go into session every two years, mm -hmm. and uh, you know our our, our legislators are, are citizen legislators, uh, and you know they don't really get they get paid a little, not not very much. Um, what else? What was uh? So you're, you're, you know, true service to, to the state. And I can't thank you enough, Tom. Um, what were the, some other big things you guys were interested in working on on this session? You're going back in a special session. What do you, what do you expect yeah. there? Well, we're trying to get everybody on the same page about how to best relieve people's property tax burden. And that's really mm -hmm. what the special session comes down to. And there's been a, uh, I would say, a prop realistically, probably a six month stalemate, although the, the, the Texas house is, repeatedly passed uh, legislation, you know, has has made every effort to kind of um, meet meet the Senate halfway. There's just sort of been a fundamental disconnect What's the debate? Uh, between the two chambers. Well, the debate, I think, essentially settles uh, along the lines of there's three mechanisms for lowering property taxes that are being looked at. Uh, one is what we refer to as compression, uh, which is essentially where the state pays more for uh, something uh, and the local property tax levy is decreased by that same amount. And so where that, where you see that in Texas is with uh, schools, with public school finance. So mm -hmm. if the state shoulders a, a higher percentage burden of funding public education, that allows local taxing entities to lower their tax rate by a commensurate amount. So we call that compression. Okay. Um, there's also the issue of appraisal caps. Uh, and whether or not um, what's really killing uh, businesses, homeowners, even renters is the fact that in the market in which we live, that there's not a, a fundamentally, you know, a justifiable connection between the value of the home and what you could actually sell it for. Uh, and that that number is just continuing to elevate and spiral out of control. So even if I hold your property tax rate constant, 
your taxes still go up every year because the valuation on your property goes up. So I like appraisal that one because, you know, I, I, I spent 10 years in California. I like the way they do it. I did like my property tax there better. And their appraisal is what you bought it for. It doesn't change. Right. That's what that's right. And so yeah. that's that's two. And then three is essentially the the idea of increasing the amount of first dollar or first dollars of valuation that we will not subject to a tax that we will exempt from tax. We call that the homestead exemption. Mm -hmm. Now that that only catches you if it's a, if it's a home in which you live. Uh, so it doesn't help you if you're a business owner. It doesn't help you if you're a landlord. It certainly doesn't help you if you're a renter. Um, but if you own the home or you know live and live in that home, then for that home you could increase um, the amount of dollars of value that are not subject to tax, and so you lower the amount of taxation overall right. by exempting it. We call that the homestead exemption. Yeah. So Wait, now, is, is there a homestead exemption now, and what would it be there rose? There, what, what is it now? What, like, what would I, it be I, raised I, to? It's about thirty thousand. We were talking about raising oh. it worth to a hundred thousand. Yeah, so, okay, thirty thousand is like nothing, really. I mean, when was that? When was that established? That that number? We actually increased it last legislative session. So okay. in the special session of twenty one, we actually increased it. I think I don't remember what it was before that, and um, but we just recently increased it. But the idea was increase it again. Right. So that's that's sort of the big fight right now. Can, is can, uh, can we do a Texas? Can we do a Texas tax. taxation one hundred and one real quick for the listeners? All right, how does Texas get yeah. revenue? All right, so property taxes are a big one, but like yeah. you said, a lot of that is local taxes. So how does the state? Right. So if, if so, in the compression model that you just talked about, how is the state going to get more money to therefore pick up more of the burden for those local expenses? Where do they? Where does the state get money from? So the state gets money from a variety of sources, but I think the two biggest ones to highlight are the sales tax. Mm -hmm. that you pay on all goods and services except those that are exempt you know like food medicines you don't actually pay sales tax on food and medicine mm -hmm. um and then what we call severance taxes which is uh revenue that the state derives from the development of oil and gas in our state yeah. and i will tell you for all of the you know environmentalists out there and the people that want to go net zero and shut off the pipelines all together we will sorry it's okay. Sorry. This is the capital right here. Okay. So this is yeah. good. We're talking about environmental stuff. So I didn't move. And so they're like, it's energy, energy, energy efficient, very energy efficient. But, uh, we like it. We're very efficient in Texas. Yeah. Like it. Yeah. So if we shut off the tap uh, and just had no more collection of severance taxes, we would probably lose about 85 to 90% of the money that is used to fund public education would dry up. Wow. So, I mean, that was a huge that's a massive amount. It is. It's a very big, very big amount. And I think uh, people are shocked by that because they still see their property taxes. They see what goes their local ISD. And I see it. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> um, I mean, and you're saying that's not even a fraction of uh, it's not, uh, the, the, the severance. That's that 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 oil and gas tax really it's makes huge. up for the, the bulk of it. So what, what about school choice? What's going to happen there? This is a, this is a hot topic. Well, I'll tell you what's interesting about school choice is you were talking earlier about, you know, sort of people crossing the aisles and, you know, were there people that supported you and, and stuff like that. that. The fascinating thing to school choice, this is my fourth session, uh, the school choice debate is, is, is unique in that the, uh, the dividing line between yays and nays, so to speak, is nonpartisan. Mm. It has nothing. To do interesting. With it has everything to do with where you represent. Which makes a lot more sense. Yeah. So it's very interesting to see sort of suburban conservative, you know, um, I would argue, um, you know, traditional kind of mm -hmm. small government conservative Republicans and their partners uh, working alongside them are inner city Democrats that represent failing school districts. Yeah. And that is your that is your school choice crowd. Uh, and then on the other side, you have. Uh, Democrats that don't represent uh, those failing school districts and or uh, are completely cowed and afraid of AFT and the other teachers unions mm. uh, in combination with a lot of my rural colleagues on the Republican side who many of whom are conservative members. You know, they're not yeah. these are not uh, these are not exclusively some of them are moderate, but these are not exclusively moderate Republicans. So it's not a conservative right. versus moderate thing. It's a. Uh, 
if I represent a district that is, you know, 300 square miles and I have 15 or 20 different school districts, and in each of the small towns I represent, the school district is the largest employer by, you know, two thirds of the economy for that yeah. small town. I care a lot about the public schools. Now, school choice is never coming to my small town, um, but I care a lot about finance yeah. of those public schools. So it's interesting. We, we've, uh, it's always been a high, high bar in the house. We've, we've never actually passed meaningful school choice legislation in the house because what is, what, what is the main proposal? There's obviously different kinds of school choice. Uh, I'm hearing a voucher system as, as a major possibility. And, and I don't right. understand the car. I, 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 I mean, I know what the counter arguments are, I guess I, I don't, I never see how those counter arguments would play out. Like it's going to hurt your public school. I'm always like, how, how is it going to hurt your public school? And like to the rural, to the rural reps, I'm like, it's not like there's going to be this like major exodus of students. I mean, by definition, because it's rural, they're not going to just go to another school. It's not going to happen. Um, so I'm like, well, what, 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 what are the realistic concerns? Yeah. So, I mean, to your point, I mean, just, just to kind of piggyback on what you just said, the governor's proposal uh, that that he put forward, the original sort of proposal we looked at in, in January, essentially held harmless. If a student was sitting in a seat in a public school and you were getting a certain allotment, what we call an average daily allotment or an ADA mm -hmm. for that student, and that student left and went and embraced school choice and took that ESA money and went to a private school, you're held harmless. The state still pays you for a seat, which is now cold and empty. And for no how many one's, years is it forever or like, how I can't I don't remember, honestly where, what it was, but I just thought like, now that's really interesting. So what we're saying is, cause one of the big mm -hmm. arguments was, well, if school choice comes then because you just this lose money like that child, then some of these school districts will struggle to keep their doors open. You know, they'll have to lay off staff. They'll, they'll have to consolidate. It'll be terrible. It'll be the end of, of yeah. humanity as we know it. You know, kind and, that, of and that's key. I remember this debate uh, when I was in college. I'm, to, I'm, I'm ashamed of it. I'm just, sorry. I mean, we're having a Texas conversation. So it's like a really, it's hard for me to talk about college. Um, when I went to Tufts. Okay. Sorry. I just did. I don't know. I don't know why. Um, why I do you know, I, I will, I will say I, you know, because my dad was in oil and gas and I was living abroad during high school in Columbia. Um, I wasn't a resident of Texas at the time. So I didn't even get into UT. I applied, didn't get in. I didn't get into Rice. I remind them of that because I represented them in my last district. Um, so, and, and my parents met at AM, and so they're big Aggies. And uh, and so as a teenager, you know, doesn't want to do anything his parents did. That was really the only reason. That's the only reason I can think of that I didn't go to AM. and there, There's a lot of regret there. I'll be perfectly honest. There's a lot of, I think I would have been really fun college experience. Um, so I'll do tough. Anyway, one of my, in, in, in one in one class I took, actually, this wasn't my master's program. This wasn't even, this wasn't even an undergrad, but we were required to go do some political activism. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is, by the way, I was not a very political person before the day I ran for Congress. Really? That, that, I find that hard to believe because you know, the I wasn't, well. I, you know, I was a policy person. So I did my master's in, you know, public policy. My undergrad was in foreign policy. I was a policy person, but as you know, that's different than being a politician. And so I had never block walked in my entire life and in order to have any plans to. Um, and then so I block walked for uh, an advocacy issue and it was a school choice issue. It was a school choice measure on the ballot in Massachusetts. It was a good one. It was just, it was just, it was, no, sorry. It was a charter school. It was charter schools. It's similar mm -hmm. thing, obviously, similar debate. Um, and all the arguments were similar, like charter schools supposedly suck up money from public schools. And the argument I heard over and over again, like this is a, this is a, again, you're in Cambridge. So it's like a super high, highly liberal, very affluent and very well educated population. Like they knew what the, the issue was. It was interesting. It was really it was a really interesting experience. And they'd be like, OK, well, it's going to take money from public schools. And it, most people would be like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Chart, what's a, you know, whatever. But like yeah. they, they knew. And, and so I would and I had something to counter back. I was like, now nah, the governor and a, the, the Republican governor at the time, Charlie Baker, um, I don't know why Massachusetts got rid of him. You guys are screwed now. I don't know why you did that. But um, there's, there's a lot more to that story, to be clear. He didn't run again. But anyway, the point is, but but there's a reason he didn't run again. Anyway, what, what, I, I digress. The counter argument was this. You got five years for that money to like slowly stair step down. So you don't lose it immediately. 
you have time to adapt. You will not, there's not going to be this like sudden blow to your finances. And that worked. I mean, it's a good policy. I don't think it should last forever. I don't think it should get that ADA for, for that right. MTC forever, but like a few years, you know, like let the system balance a little bit. Like that's a totally reasonable thing. Like everybody wins here. It's always been, it's, it's always been hard for me to, I understand. And I hear it from my own constituents too, because they don't, they're like, well, I like my school. I don't, and people don't want to leave my school. Are you tell me a bunch of people are going to come to my school and, and overcrowd it. Cause that's, so that's another concern that, that it doesn't matter. Republican Democrat doesn't matter who you are. They just have that concern. Um, and and those, are, those are things we have to address. Like, yeah. Is, is there like a limiting factor to how many students can transition to a school? There's gotta be right. Like there's gotta be a cap. Um, well, you got classrooms and teachers and resources yeah. to, to be able to, to educate them. I mean, so right. yeah, I would think there could be, you know, um, what I don't know. Uh, I wonder sometimes if if part of the issue here is that there's a fundamental fear uh, that's unspoken. I don't hear this a lot from folks in pub ed, but I I sort of get this impression after talking to them that that there's sort of a fundamental fear that if school choice is successful, that essentially public education becomes nothing more than a safety net program. Um, yeah. Because a lot of times the <laughs> argument is, well, you know, all of these alternative educational pathways can do one thing that we can't do. And that is that they can say, no, you know, they can take a child that has behavioral problems that is, um, you know, that is struggling uh, and they can just say, sorry, you're not a good fit for our school. Uh, and we can't do that. So if you're yeah, going to let everybody point. flee, then what we're left with is a system where it's a very, very difficult environment to educate anyone um, because, you know, there's sort of this, downward spiral it's an understandable I, I fear say that out loud but that's sort of the impression i get that that's sort of the underlying fear is that it, we don't want to become a safety net program it's an understandable fear i would just argue that's a little unrealistic like you know the, the, again this mass exodus idea just feels it seems very unrealistic to me people there still has to be a way for that student parents to get them to that other school they're not on that bus the bus route anymore like there's just there's a lot of factors that that just i think make that untrue um you know it's and and like and also i would be like well should you try something because isn't that the case with a lot of our inner city schools right now already i mean it can it get much worse you know kids have the kids these days have access to the in, in the entire knowledge of the entire world on their phone like, isn't that crazy? You and me grew up with, yeah. I, I, I used, encyc I'm not, you know, uh, I used encyclopedias in high school to research <laughs> Google. I learned about Google in 11th grade in high school. I found out what Google was and it didn't the have a lot. Catalog. It was the internet. It didn't have a lot on it. Like it was, it wasn't that you remember useful. having to pull the drawers of the card catalog out and go through the little cards to find the book that you were looking for. And then yeah. put the number down and have to go look for it. That was a thing, you know, yeah. like that, that was a thing. Um, it, it's, and so, you know, college had the internet, high school didn't. So I know, I know what both worlds are like. And um, uh, I, so anyway, we have this situation where there's some of the worst performing students in, in our history. And it doesn't make sense with, with all these tech, with all of the advantages possible. Now AI is coming onto the scene. I mean, I don't know what the heck that does. Um, it could either be a godsend, it could either be super useful, or it could be a method for students to cheat and and and, and learn even less. I'm like, I'm not sure which one it will it will be. It probably, obviously, it will be a mix of both. Um, you know, and and, and yeah, teachers are going to have to adapt to that rather quickly. Teachers are going to have to figure out, okay, like how do I? I can't go tell you to write an essay now because you could just it's ask right. Chat GPT, GPT to write you right. an essay. Yeah. So like we have Unless to change how we right do here. things. Right. Right. Yeah. And like, I, no, I, so, I think that's right. I've got a I've got a young man that just graduated from high school and he's starting off to college in the fall. And uh, we were talking about this and it's it's scary that you can tell chat GPT to write me a term paper on Shakespeare's Othello. Uh, and it and it's it'll not just bad. It, right? It's pretty and it, good. <laughs> and it's unique and it's not plagiarism and it's not your work. But nobody will ever be able to say, I know where you got this from. Right. I haven't had time to like dive in. I'm so fascinated by this. Like I haven't had time to do, I want to give chat GPT from like different accounts. I want to give it the exact same uh, instructions, see what it does. Like I actually, nobody's told me what, what, like, does it write different essays every time? You know, like, I don't know. I mean, 
I wonder <laughs> how long is it going to be before you think uh, Chat GPT starts writing uh, uh, bills at, at both the state and federal level? I, I've got a colleague that was actually playing around with that just to see what it what, if it could do it. You know, yeah. um, I mean, if you council, kind yeah. of understand the body of administrative code and law that we currently have, and you say, hey, write me a bill that basically, you know. Um, lowers the age to to buy uh whatever um right or raises well, whatever you kind of do it yeah i mean i well i think that's one of the so because you're talking about a legislative council at that point so i mean you know I, you guys do the same way we do it i assume like i have an idea and i'm like yeah i want to i want to and i want to uh you know limit <laughs> limit funding the children's hospitals if they don't do x y and z like what we just talked about but that's that's mostly to the extent to which I like I say what I want. I don't write anything because it's written in legal language, leg legislative counsel, uh, 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 teams and teams of lawyers that live on Capitol Hill or live in Austin. They 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 actually write it. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. One has to be written in legal language. Plus, sometimes when you write a bill, you're changing law. So you have to address the the, the previous code that you're addressing and you're replacing words. Like it's super tedious. And like we're not doing that. We have a concept and we make it. We're like the CEOs driving the ship. We're not, we're not in the engine room. And so just to explain to people. And then, but but broader than that, so of course I think the answer is of course that could easily be done by a, not easily, but I mean we're, you get to that point. But then you talk about the the legal profession in general, you know contracts yeah. and 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 like these these super tedious things. Should it still be overseen by a lawyer? Will it will it make lawyers unemployed? Like I don't maybe not um, because I think it I don't want a purely Chat GPT AI led uh, contract. I still want a person to give me their right. judgment, but. You know, but that person, uh, instead of charging you nine hours for that, uh, really can't justify charging you more than 30 minutes now. So this, long, is, this is massive long, changes. Maybe they can take more clients now. I don't know. I mean, maybe it works out. Yeah. How long does it take in Congress? when you, like you, So you put in a, a request for legislation. Hmm. How long does it take typically before your legislative council returns a a draft to you that you can look over and decide whether you want to file that or not. Uh, that, that, that changes massively depending on, on how complex. I mean, so for kind of a typical bill, maybe that's, it's really not that complicated. The, the a few pages, it, it shouldn't be more than a week or two. Um, Sometimes for us, it's uh, months, you know, uh, even for simple bills, cause it's sort of first come first serve and right. uh, doctors get busy. And uh and yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I mean, this is one of the issues that we see is that uh, if you think about it, in order to be a drafter of legislation, you got to be a pretty smart attorney. Um, and the state and probably the federal government, too, probably doesn't pay you the same wage that you can make out in the private sector. Yeah. And so it can be hard to staff up and have the appropriate number of people that you need to draft the work product that you need. Sounds like uh, Texas, so I don't needs a, Texas needs a few extra hands then doing that. I mean, you're only well, we, in session we, we, once. Oh, maybe that's part of the problem is they're not permanent jobs. Well, yeah. And the speaker actually has talked about, you know, we need to invest more in the legislative council um, because we need more hands on deck. Um, you know, I'm sure you saw some of the stuff that happened this session with points of order and, and bills and things like that. Some of that is just because staff lawyers are overworked uh, and they don't, you know, they don't uh, get it right on the first try, maybe. And, uh, you know, they put something in in the report that's generated after a bill comes out of committee that's not accurate or maybe misleading. And then, of course, that leads to a parliamentary maneuver on the House floor that temporarily stops or potentially even kills that bill. Um, it, it's and, one and of the reasons this gets to a whole other conversation about representation and, you know, the, the talk about term limits and this, this sort of. Um, oh happy view of a of a citizen legislator right uh almost naive in, in ways I, I think people have this sort of cincinnatus perspective on what a legislator should be you know you you, you come from normal life you, you do your duty for a couple of years and you, and you come back home and you save the space for somebody else and I'm like i you know you're by doing that, you're institutionalizing inexperience and right. this, it, it is a profession. Like there's, there's a lot to learn a lot. Um, that might've been a, that, 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 that might've been a, a nice idea 
in the early days of the Republic when truly life wasn't that complicated. Uh, but even then, like our, our founding fathers were, were, were elitists. They were highly educated, more educated than 99.999% of the population is it was, they, they instituted a Republic, not a democracy for a few, quite a few reasons. Um, I've been seeing a lot of uh, talk about term limits, um, you know, making that a floor vote for us and the federal level. And um, I always remind my fellow Texans, kind of Texas congressman, you know, we we come from a state with no term limits, and uh, it doesn't it works yeah. out okay. What 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 are the? I mean, you could argue for some term limits, uh, you know, at a certain point, but but what I point out to people is, you get run over by staff professional staff and 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 the and the administrative state if you have inexperienced representatives up there just trying to figure out where the bathroom is uh right. it's, just, it's not as good of an idea as you think what, what do you think about paying our, our state legislators i i'm always thinking you guys should get paid but i don't know that's my opinion but we do get paid we get, well, get paid, paid a little dollars a month unless we're actually in session and then we get a per diem and so it it, it bumps it up but um but i think that's actually the way we we limit the term that that is term limits. Um, yeah. um, I think you're. I think you're right on. I, I I've often wondered if if fundamentally underlying the reason why people say there should be term limits has to do with a completely different problem um, that Alexander Hamilton actually wrote about. Since you mentioned the, the founding fathers, um, and that is that after our republic was established, he wrote to one of his friends that he was concerned that he was starting to see people who were running for Congress that were looking to be involved in government that weren't there out of a self-sacrificial nature, that they were there because they wanted to enrich themselves. They, they wanted to serve themselves. They wanted to be somebody. They wanted to be powerful. They wanted to have a golden parachute. They wanted, you know, all of this stuff. And I sometimes wonder whether the argument for term limits, if, if part of the issue there is that it's a reaction to the fact that there is an elected class of people who go into this, not because they come from a worldview of I'm here to serve others. Like I know you do. And like I do, I mean, that's kind of our worldview is I'm here to serve. I didn't come here to be served. I came to serve um, and to give up something in order to do that is perfectly okay. But I sometimes wonder whether the conversation about term limits isn't more around the idea of if we can't trust people to be self-sacrificial in the way that they represent us, then maybe the best alternative to that is to rotate them out on a periodic basis so they don't get too comfortable, too powerful, and too used to the office that they're in. Right. Yeah. So, and there, 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 and there's like... Federal. And then there's certainly like a number you could come across where it's like, okay, this doesn't have the harm that I'd be worried about, which is again, institutionalized inexperience into just empowering the, the, the professionals, you know, the professional staff and the professional administrative state. We rotate through each other like a, like a revolving door. Um, and, and they're all friends. And so I'm like, you know, you need, you need representatives who said, you know what, uh, 10 years ago, I saw this happen and this is how we dealt with it. You need mm -hmm. those, you need those old bulls in there. The reason I say like, I, I don't like, I'm not sure I like that you guys don't get paid is look, I would never have taken your job. I was leaving the military. Right. I, I couldn't, I just couldn't do what you're doing. It's, it's just not a, it's not possible. Uh, so you are, you are by, by, by not real. I mean, you say you get paid, but you don't really get, but you don't get paid any kind of wage that makes this a living at all. Even though you, you guys don't, and it's also really not true that our representatives in Texas just work like six months every two years. That's not really true. Uh, you you, you constantly have a amount of time. Yeah. yeah, you do a lot. Um, it's not like our schedule, but it's it's still a lot, and it's it's certainly obvious to me that you can't have a solid career. Well, I mean, you do because you're. Well, it has to be like you though. Like you're a doctor, so you can kind of choose when you do treatments, right? I mean, it, it's you can't have a nine to five job that you just, you just, it's just not possible. It's gotta be a certain type of work. Um, and I think that just, it excludes a lot of potentially uh, good representatives uh, from, from the equation. It does. But I, I would say the flip side of that is that um, what I like about it, what you said is, is spot on a hundred percent accurate. But the flip side of that is that, you know, for a fact that the people who are serving in, in the Texas House and the Texas Senate, really, um, because of the minuscule amount that they get paid, um, they have already calculated the opportunity cost. 
Yep. Um, and they've made a decision to sacrifice in order to serve um, because you can't do this job uh, and not have another job. Right. And so that means that you're giving up a lot of free time. You're giving up time with your family. You're giving up the opportunity to make income at your other job because you're not there because you're here. Um, and so I do think that kind of like what I was saying earlier, I think it does set up an environment where it, it is, it discourages uh, yeah. people that are sort of looking for a place to park for a career. Uh, and it encourages people to that are like, for this season of my life, I'm choosing to give back. And the and way I want to do that is by representing my, my constituents. You can definitely convince me of this. Um, so you could you could convince me of this in two ways. You've already said one, which is you're, you're right. Like by definition, it's a self sacrifice. It's, it's honestly hard to see it any other way. Um, mm -hmm. But number two, well, you didn't say, but you got me thinking about it because you kind of have to be successful in, in some form or fashion to even to make that sacrifice, like or you're homeless. It's, it's one of the two, um, and so. And so you you naturally get a group of people at the state level that have made it in life, right? Or, or have some kind of qualification that that have has made them money. And, and like you can, some people don't like it when people make money. I get that, but for the most part, you know, it's you're usually making money because you have a certain skill set that uh, that 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 people want and people value, and you bring something to the table. Uh, and you can't actually say that about the U.S. Congress, obviously. Uh, there's some very unsuccessful people uh, who who ran for who ran for Congress and made it. It's it's in some ways it's yeah you know, whatever. I don't need to dive into that. Everybody knows how well, we, how how many people can slip through the cracks and get voted in. I mean, we have that problem here too. I don't don't uh, don't think for a I moment know. it's unique. We we call them. We say in in Texas we say there's only two types of lawmakers. There are workhorses and there are show ponies and you very yeah. quickly figure out which one you are. Right. And there are those of us that roll up our sleeves and quietly get the work done uh, that moves, moves the economy forward and keeps us in the right direction. And then there are those that just want to go uh, attack everyone else all the time and, you know, move to the right of you and say, you know, me good, him bad, you know, um, me smart, him dumb, you know, kind of, but they don't actually ever really do anything. Yeah. What they do you think? They, they, they're, they're kind of a common, um, uh, I don't know, truism in, in political science where they, you know, the claim is that in the U.S. Congress, 90% uh, of the work is done by 10% of the members. Maybe it's 90 10, maybe it's 80 20. Either way, it definitely rings true. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what would you say the number is in the, in the Texas House? I would say it's, it's I, I think the majority of House members in the Texas House are workhorse. Courses. I think there's, you know, I think one of the really unique things, I think, I think it's unique. I don't know, maybe, maybe you see the same thing in Washington, but um, the, the, the vast majority, and by that, I mean, probably greater than 90% of legislation that passes both chambers and makes it to the governor's desk is bipartisan. Um, it is just good governance. You know, it yeah. is paying our bills. It is investing in our future. It is, you know, keeping uh, government right sized. So, you know, there are consumer protections, but we're also not trampling on businesses. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that everybody agrees on. So yeah. it's not uncommon to have a bill get to the governor's desk that has to do with, you know, I don't know, let's just say something to do with insurance, which is my, my area. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'll have two Democrats and two Republicans in both chambers uh, and a whole host of sponsors and co-authors uh, and it vote and it votes out, you know, pretty unanimously um, because it's just smart policy. Um, and I think most members in the Texas House probably have policies like that that they've worked on. It's a pretty small percentage, but the thing is, you know who the show ponies are because those are the ones that are constantly criticizing everything that everyone else is doing, while at the same time they've got nothing legislatively to point to of their own that they've actually achieved it's right they just want to be critical of everyone else all the time yeah that's that's politics and i know, it, it, I know that, you know who those people are in congress because i see them on i see yeah. them on the talk shows all the time of course and it's just it's gotten it's gotten more annoying and, and frankly worse i don't know why i'm still surprised by any of it but uh it's there's just political capital to be gained by doing it and so you know my message to the people is because people are always like can't you guys just get stuff done and just just 
be normal. And I'm like, well, the, the problem is there's, there's too many voters that, that, um, that incentivize that kind of behavior, right? Reward sure. it. Too many people who, who incentivize the, the generation of clicks and like, forget about politicians. I mean, there's a, what I call the political entertainment industry on the right. Mm. Cause I, I think, I think the right likes political entertainment more than the left does. I think the left likes winning more. And so when they get together, they talk about block walking and registering voters and, and doing these like actionable items. Um, you know, I point out that they, 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 they come from this history of labor union organization. And so they're much better at organizing. They think like organizers, uh, they're not good at governing, but they're good at activism. And, and the right has not figured that out, uh, in my opinion. Um, obviously, some groups do it great. Like, it depends on where you are. I don't want to, like, create a broad brush. But, you know, for the most part, I see a lot of this, like, kind of this, this, whether it's Instagram accounts or Twitter accounts or podcasters or whatever, like, fake news sites just popping up constantly that are just meant for that red meat. And, um, you know, it eventually just lies to people and kind of makes them un- un- unnecessarily emotional and angry. And it, make, it makes the job of winning much more difficult. We'll fix there's, it. A, there's a whole cottage industry, I think, in our state of organizations like what you described that, mm-hmm. I mean, they're pretty easy to spot because they're, there's the, they're, what they're really good at making as an industry is they manufacture outrage. Yeah. Um, and and you can tell what the talking points are right away. Yeah. I mean, if you're reading one of their articles, you get progressively more angry at people the longer you read it. Um, And the other thing is that they're easy to spot because they almost never help out in a general election. They're almost never helping the Republican Party uh, elect Republican members over Democrat members. They're almost always involved in primaries um, and attacking people uh, and saying, well, you know, he's okay, but he's not good enough. Right. Or yeah, he, yeah. he voted the wrong way on this particular measure. So, you know, we should draw him and quarter him, you know, I mean, it, it's just this, this unbelievable industry of manufactured outrage. And the reality is, is that it raises a fair amount of money for them. It's become a cottage industry in our state. It's very it, frustrating. It, everywhere. I mean, it's everywhere. And it's um, I, my, one of my goals, and it's like a problem we got to figure out is, is how to, train voters to to recognize it because like it's you and me and like uh, that was obviously written by one of these outraged performance artists like it's obvious yeah. and, and i think and it's hard to train people to, to see that but maybe one of the things i would advise is 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 that you look to see if they offered a concrete achievable solution and if because if you look at a wall street journal article or a national review article um or you listen to like ben shapiro's podcast he always has like a a problem to make you mad, right? We, that's not that's not the problem. That's not the issue I have is 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 pointing out problems. But if you're not drawing the reader's attention to some kind of reasonable solution, then you then you are faking them out, right? And that's, that's, right. that's and the other the other thing is 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 the is the writer focusing more on fellow Republicans than Democrats, right? Are yeah. they are they saying like the real problem is the rhinos? Like as a telltale sign too. It's always BS. Everything they say from that moment forward is usually BS. Um, you know, because they, small, they did small tent stuff, right? Small party, small tent, right? Purity tests. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you're if you're not with us 100 percent of the time, then you're our enemy. It's exactly the opposite of what Reagan talked about when he talked about the big tent Republican Party and drawing people in and helping people to realize that their default mechanism is to be a conservative voter. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's that's a good point. That helping them realize that their default is, is conservative, because right? I think that's true. I, I say that all. I think middle America. Just, I mean, what I mean by that is that the, the middle of the spectrum of the political spectrum is, is default way more conservative than they would label themselves as. But you just have to help them understand. That. <laughs> you know, be conservative, but don't be angry about it, and you'll win. The formula yeah. isn't that hard. <laughs> the formula is not that hard. All right, I kept you longer than an hour, uh, longer than I said I would. Um, Dr. Tom Oliverson, thank you for your, your service to Texas. We look forward to seeing what y'all put out. There's a lot of issues we didn't even come close to getting to. Um, I, I think that that just means we had a lot of cool things to talk about and what y'all are doing. So maybe we'll have to just do it again, get an update as you wrap up the session, see where the school choice bill went, see where, um, uh, there's a border security bill. I didn't even get to that. Uh, I, your work on Medicaid, we got a lot of so many other things to talk about. So Thanks for being on, Tom. We'll, we'll do it again. 
Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for having me. And thank you for your service to our country, both in uh, the Navy as well as in Congress. We, we really, really need more people like you in Congress. Appreciate it. I'm glad I'm glad you're <laughs> I just likewise, likewise, really. Um, it's an honor to serve alongside you for Texas.